If there's one thing Latin American history has is a long list of missed opportunities, close calls, and wrong turns. What were some of those key moments and how my Latin American history ended up differently if some of those situations had not turned out the way they did? Join me to see the top key turning points in Latin American history. Before we begin, let me clarify two things. One, there have been many turning points outside of the region, like the Great Depression, the beginning of the Cold War, and so on, that had indirect effect on great power politics, which in turn had a huge impact in Latin America. But for now, we'll just consider those with a more direct effect. And two, there are many turning points that were hugely important in individual countries' histories, the rise of Perón, the death of Don Pedro, and so on, but were less important in relationship to other countries. We'll leave those for another time. So without further ado, let's consider what I think are the top 10 turning points in Latin American history. Number one, the arrival of Columbus to the Americas in 1492. This is not just a turning point in Latin American history, but world history. Without Columbus, colonization, the Atlantic slave trade, the death of millions through European transmittable diseases, the introduction of horses to the Americas, and the exchange of foods like chocolate, tomatoes, and potatoes back to Europe, would have looked different. How much different is hard to say. Only eight years later, the Portuguese accidentally landed in what is now Northeast Brazil as they were trying to get to India. They found the stop useful as a place where they could resupply their ships, but they only became interested in its settlement several decades later. That was only after other European powers began to try to settle the region, so the Portuguese tried to maintain their claim under the Treaty of Tordesillas, which divided the world between Spain and Portugal after Columbus's voyages. Had Columbus' caravels been lost at sea or never embarked in the first place, it's unclear how long it would have been for European powers to try to colonize the Americas. The Portuguese riches from the Far East would still have whetted European appetites, so it's very likely that another European power, or Portugal itself, would have become interested in settling Brazil at roughly the same time that they did. However, had that happened, it could have meant that some other European power could have encountered the Aztecs or Incas, and at a much later date than they did. Had that happened, the resistance could have been different or more successful. But even if colonized, Latin America might look closer to Africa or Asia, ex-colonies to multiple different European powers, and of course, Europe itself would have looked different without an all-powerful Spain and Portugal competing and dictating terms throughout most of the 16th and well into the 17th century. Number 2. Hernán Cortés and his men die On the early morning of July 1, 1520, Cortés and his men came close to dying at the hands of the Aztecs as they tried to flee the Aztec capital of Tenochtitlán. The Spanish had been invited to what is now Mexico City by Moctezuma, the Aztec emperor, but they soon overstayed their welcome. Faced with a siege and facing shortages of food, water, and gunpowder, their position became even more precarious after his own enraged people killed Moctezuma, thus the need to escape in the middle of the night. Their plan resulted in the loss of between 400 to 800 Spanish and 2,000 or 4,000 allied natives who were killed. But Hernán Cortés survived along with enough men to attempt the eventual conquering of Tenochtitlán. What would have happened instead if they had been wiped out that day? Without Cortés and his men, any subsequent Spanish conquistadors would have lacked crucial information about the city. Undoubtedly, there would probably have been future conquest attempts, but even if successful, which was by no means guaranteed, they would probably have taken much longer than the year it actually took. This would have changed not just the colonization pattern of Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador, but also the missions in the American Southwest and the colonization of the Philippines, which in turn would have meant less gold for the Spanish and who knows what for their iron grip on Latin America. And just as possible, Mexico might have been a territory that was never conquered, sort of like what happened with the Mapuches in Chile. Imagine that world. Number 3. The Haitian Revolution Turns Out Differently The Haitian Revolution is a major world event that, although often ignored, had huge repercussions for Latin America. Things could have turned out quite different, though. In December 1801, Napoleon sent a massive French fleet to reconquer Haiti under the leadership of his brother-in-law, Charles Leclerc. The expedition was successful at first. They soon put most of the ports and large part of the country under French occupation, and even captured the main Haitian revolutionary leader, Toussaint Leverture. It was not to last, however, as yellow fever decimated the French troops, including Leclerc himself, 
And then, to make things worse, instead of trying to negotiate with people, the French tried to re-enslave the population, which directly paved the way in 1803 for the final battle of the revolution and the expulsion of the French. But what if yellow fever had not been so deadly to the French, or what if they had tried to negotiate instead of trying to bring back slavery? The lack of an independent Haiti would have meant that the French would not have sold Louisiana to the United States, which would have radically altered the American expansion into the West, and might have brought the French into conflict with the Mexicans earlier than the 1860s. There would probably be an independent French-speaking country in the middle of North America, and either a much larger Mexico, since there probably would never have been a Mexican war, or a French-speaking Mexico, as the French occupation might have been more successful than its 1860s version was. Another key change is that of Simón Bolívar's third campaign. By 1815, Bolívar had already tried to liberate Venezuela twice, and twice he had been defeated and expelled. The second time he sought refuge in Jamaica, but after an assassination attempt he fled for Haiti. There he received support from Alexander Pétion, the Haitian president who provided him with men and materiel. These were absolutely critical in his third and final reconquest of Venezuela. Had that not happened, Bolívar might well have never succeeded in his dreams of liberation of Venezuela, or the rest of northern South America, as it actually occurred. But even if he had, it would probably have taken much longer, which might have resulted in completely different geographical divisions, stability, and leaders in Colombia, Venezuela, Ecuador, Peru, and even Bolivia. And of course, without an independent Haiti, the history of the Dominican Republic would have been totally different. There would have been no independence war against the Haitians, and there probably would not have been a return to the Spanish fold in the 1860s. Number 4. What if Napoleon had not tried to impose his brother as King of Spain? By 1808, Spain had long been under turmoil because of the Napoleonic Wars, popular discontent with the king because of economic unrest, and intrigue in the court between the heir apparent Ferdinand VII and his father's prime minister, Manuel de Godoy. Spanish America, however, had remained more or less immune to those issues, but when Napoleon tried to impose his brother, Joseph I, as king of Spain, Spanish authority in the colonies broke down. This, in turn, led to numerous declarations of autonomy in Venezuela, Argentina, Bolivia, and Ecuador, and would spark the Spanish Wars of Independence. But what would have happened had Napoleon opted to leave the crown alone? Demand for change in the monarchy had been growing in Spain for decades, and when Ferdinand VII was restored in 1813, he was forced to rule with a more liberal framework that had been created with the 1812 Constitution of Cádiz. This division between liberals and conservatives would rock the country through wars and conflict for the next 100 years, and would be present all the way to the Spanish Civil War in the 1930s. So even without Napoleon's imposition, there would have been political conflict in Spain, but what would that have meant for Latin America? Although there had been rebellions against the Spanish prior to 1808, before the deposition of Fernando VII, there simply was not much public support for independence, at least among the elite. Thus, Latin America might well have continued in a trajectory similar to Cuba and Puerto Rico, where wars of independence did not occur until the late 19th century. Another possibility is that as the liberals gained power in Spain, the crown might have allowed more self-rule in its colonies, and even developed a confederation of sorts. Indeed, that is what Juan O'Donoghue, the last viceroy of New Spain, tried to do when he signed the treaties of Córdoba that made Mexico independent. Had that happened, Latin American countries might have been larger and more stable than they ended up being. Number five, Central America stays together. One of the more fascinating Latin American what-ifs is what would have happened if Central America had remained a single country. They certainly tried. Central America was a republic that lasted from 1823 until roughly the late 1830s, although officially it remained in existence until 1841. A lot of things went wrong for them, though, not least divisions amongst the elites. So there's no single thing that could have gone differently that would have kept them together. But had they been able to, a lot of what happened later would have been avoided. For one, the instability and authoritarianism that permeated it was directly linked to the competition between the countries and the constant intervention from their neighbors. Of course, the U.S. also intervened, 
especially after the 1850s. But had they remained a single country, Central Americans would have been in a better position to prevent American intervention, and the whole region might look like Costa Rica today. That would mean no civil wars in the 80s, no dictatorships in the 60s and 70s, and no gangs in the 2000s. It might also have had a canal built across Nicaragua instead of Panama, and one that was controlled by Central Americans from the beginning. Costa Rica is the richest and best governed country in Central America. What would have happened if it was five times as big? The mind boggles. Number six, the Paraguayan War of the 1860s never happens. The largest interstate war to ever happen in South America was the Triple Alliance War, a conflict that saw the grouping of Brazil, Argentina, and Uruguay against Paraguay in the 1860s. Before the conflict, Paraguay had a very high level of literacy, and it was the most industrialized country in South America, a country on the rise. But the war absolutely decimated the country. Estimates vary, but Paraguay is believed to have lost between 60 to 70 percent of its entire population and 70 to 90 percent of its adult male population. It left a country that was a shell of its former self and that would never quite recover, leaving it as one of the poorest in South America even today. So what would have happened if Paraguay had never gone to war with its neighbors in 1864? The reasons behind the conflict were Paraguay's alliance with the Uruguayan Blanco regime and the apparent desire of Paraguay's dictator Francisco Solano López to gain what was contested territory at the time. Instead, the country ended up losing territory to both Brazil and Argentina. But had there been no war, Paraguay might well have ended up as one of the richer South American countries, maybe even higher than Argentina, especially since historians consider the war one of the main catalysts for the consolidation of the Argentine state, which is what made the prosperity of the early 20th century possible. Brazil, meanwhile, might well have maintained both the monarchy and slavery for a longer period as both institutions were undermined by the war. Uruguay would not have had such a long domination by the Colorado Party, and therefore also not by Bayismo, which is one of the things that ended up creating a prosperous Uruguay. Number 7. What if Jorge Gaitán was not assassinated? On April 9, 1948, Jorge Gaitán, a liberal and probably Colombia's next president, was murdered. His assassination sent Bogotá into massive riots and was directly linked to a 10-year civil war known simply as La Violencia, the violence. This in turn led to a brief military dictatorship, which then also gave rise to several guerrilla groups as well as the two main Cali and Medellín cartels. So what would have happened had Gaitán not been killed? At the very least, the immediate violence would not have happened and neither would the civil war. But what about the rest of it? The real question is the extent to which Gaitan might have been a Democrat or a populist in the mold of other Latin American leaders of the time. He might have turned out like a Perón or Chavez with a before and after, or more like a Getulio Vargas, a person that kept changing their ideology as the challenges shifted, but did not create a long-lasting legacy. More than likely though, whether Gaitan turned out to be a benign democrat or a populist authoritarian, it is very unlikely that guerrillas would have developed or that the state would have turned out to be so hollowed out that the cartels could have become as powerful as they became. And if those cartels didn't exist or were weaker, this would have meant no Panamanian invasion by the US against Noriega in 1989, as his drug trafficking in connection with the cartels was the reason for the attack. It would also have meant a different pattern for the Mexican cartels, although it's unlikely they would have disappeared completely. Number 8. What if the U.S. had not toppled the Guatemalan Revolution? Up until the 1940s, Guatemala had had a sorry authoritarian history where a tiny elite lorded over the mostly indigenous masses. But in 1944, there was a massive revolt that overthrew Jorge Ubico, the latest dictator to rule Guatemala. And for once, instead of getting just another authoritarian ruler, Guatemala had two men who put the country in a path of democratic change, Juan José Arevalo and Jacobo Arbenz. Complete social transformation this was not, but Guatemala had, for the first time, a genuine social concern for public goods and a peaceful democratic transition of power. Just enough social change to give everyone hope. Unfortunately for Guatemalans, part of that change was to deal with the economic dependency of the production of bananas, which happened to be owned by American companies, especially the United Fruit Company. And when their land was nationalized, the U.S. read it as a communist takeover attempt. 
So they supported a coup that not just ended the little change the revolution had brought, but reversed it completely. This, in turn, led to nearly 40 years of political upheaval until the 1990s peace accords. So what would have happened had there been no American coup? When Arbenz was deposed, Guatemalan institutions were still weak, so the key would have been Arbenz's successor, and whether that person would have continued in the same direction. But it's very possible that Guatemala might have been placed in a path similar to Pri Chavez Venezuela or Pri Allende Chile, that is, a flawed democracy that nonetheless could respond to public demands. Certainly an improvement of what actually happened. Another possibility would have been a path similar to Costa Rica, where social democracy took root and made it the most prosperous country in Central America. Regardless, a peaceful Guatemala would probably have limited violence in El Salvador, would have led to fewer U.S. interventions in Central America, and would have slowed down migration from Guatemala to Mexico and the United States. It would probably have also resulted in a quicker independence for Belize and maybe different outcomes with the Bay of Pigs in Cuba as that operation was nearly identical to what they had done in Guatemala seven years earlier. Number 9. The Cuban Revolution Goes Differently These days, the Cuban Revolution seems to have lost much of its influence in the larger region. But when it succeeded in 1959, it was a huge event that not just inspired, but actively created other movements that attempted to do the same in Latin America. But it was very close to not succeeding. Batista knew of Castro's invasion, and three days after the landing of the Grand Mayotte, on December 5, 1956, Batista's forces decimated the group, killing over half of their forces, leaving only 20 survivors. No doubt thinking the whole group had been wiped out. Of course, that was not the case, and the three most important, Fidel, Raul, and Che, all survived. But what would have happened if they hadn't? Batista had once been a pragmatic guy who was fine with the left, but in his later years hardened to a dictator with complete control over the island. Without Castro and company, he would still have faced revolts, but it's less likely they would have succeeded. Thus, in an alternative timeline, Cuba would probably have looked closer to Peru or Ecuador, where authoritarian regimes were punctuated with brief democratic experiments all the way to the 1980s. Cuba would probably be richer than today, assuming a democratic transition sometime in the 1980s or 1990s, probably also more unequal, and certainly with a very different kind of diaspora in Miami, if it had one at all. More importantly for the rest of the region, there would have been numerous movements that would have looked different starting with the ELN in Colombia and guerrilla forces in Venezuela against Betancourt. The Dominican Republic might also look completely different as one of the reasons Trujillo was assassinated was because the US was worried the Dominican Republic would turn into another Cuba. And of course, there would have been no Bay of Pigs and no Cuban Missile Crisis, which might mean that JFK would never have been assassinated, changing American history dramatically. Number 10. Salvador Allende never gets elected. If you know a little bit about Latin American or Chilean history, you probably have heard of Pinochet's coup in 1973 against Salvador Allende, the first self-proclaimed Marxist president to be freely elected anywhere. What you might not know is that Allende barely won. His margin of victory was less than 1.5% and he won only because Chile at the time did not have a runoff system like it does today. Had there been a runoff, undoubtedly he would have lost, as the other two sides would unite against him. So what would have happened if he had never been elected? One of the main reasons why Chile became so important was precisely because a Marxist was freely elected. Prior to this, Chile was simply not a priority in American circles. So without Allende, right off the bat you have a Chile that wouldn't have suffered much CIA intervention. There, of course, would not have been Pinochet and the torture and disappearance of tens of thousands. This is not to say, however, that Chile would have been conflict-free. Prior to Allende's election, the dominant system was known as the three-thirds system, where three major parties vowed for dominance. So had the 1970 election gone differently, this system might have continued on until it merged into a two-party system of right and left, which is what they have now, but in a much more peaceful way. Economically, though, the country would probably have tried neoliberalism, even without Pinochet, just as it happened in Argentina, Uruguay, and Peru. Without Allende, military interventions might well have turned out different in Argentina and Uruguay, as there might be less cover for the U.S. But even if they had not, one thing that would absolutely be different would be Operation Condor, a U.S.-backed clandestine intelligence program that looked to kill dissidents wherever they went, and of which Pinochet's Chile would be one of its main participants. 
The other thing, of course, would be that Chileans would not still be fighting over Pinochet's legacy to this day. And with that, we end our count for today. A reminder that just because history happened the way it did does not necessarily mean that it was destined to work out that way.